All is fine. We thank God. Um, so let's begin really with the issue that has captured the minds of most of my listeners this morning. Uh, my, the phone lines have been blazing, the text lines. We have pages and pages of text messages. And it's about the past situation that we have now. So before we go into anything else, right? Uh, uh, tell us, how would you tackle this past situation if you uh, were president? Um, first of all, thank you and thank you to the wonderful listeners. Um, so... I mean, with the power thing, we've always had two things so far. That is being a finance issue. Uh, government says it's uh, solving the finance issue, uh, legacy debt. Um, so which means that at this rate, uh, come 2020, there should never be any power issues. Or even by now, there shouldn't be any. Uh, the other issue we've heard so far is that we've always had uh, excess capacity. Um, and you would assume if there is excess capacity, then we shouldn't be going through the problems we're going through. Um, over the last couple of days, we've had uh, conversations in the media and from the government side around uh, various reasons why the outages are happening, uh, none of which people believe anyway. Um, my, my worry has been this. If all of these are the problems, then really the doom sort thing shouldn't have been sustained this long. Um, now, I've been talking to a few people who are in that sector, and my understanding of the problem is we do have a problem with the, uh, the, the, the phasing, or should I say the, uh, the way in which power consumption is distributed. Um, if I were to ask you, Daniel, um, at which time of the day do we get the most doomsaw? Would you say day or night? If you were to ask me. Yes. Well, we'd have to aggregate what everyone gets, but peak time is night time. Right. Nobody seems to be talking about that, Daniel. Nobody seems to be talking about that. And the question I, I would want to tackle in all of this is, um, if we have peak times being the night time and therefore where the power is used the most, how can we deal with that so that it gets even out? And there are a few ways around that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to go into that depth, but I look, there, there are companies that work in Ghana uh, who do manufacturing and all that. Uh, largely, they use energy during the day. Um, largely, consumers, which ordinary consumers like you and me, use more power during the night than we use during the day. Um, the question is, why can't we be thinking about finding a way to even out the power distribution between these two forms? Um, and therefore, whether it's by incentive or whether it's by any other means, get the manufacturing companies to start shifting the operations into areas of the day that um, uh, we don't have any major mm. power uh, issues. Which also means that if these organizations are running at those, at those times, they need individuals. Okay, so um, there are questions to be asked. Um, and I think these are very basic practical issues. I, I don't believe for one minute that it's... Uh, uh, it's just the issue of the connection between the uh, WAPCO and the uh, the the, uh, the pipelines uh, to 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 do the two-way flow of gas. Um, I think it's more than that. I think the government needs to be honest and say, you know what, um, there is a problem here. Or there is a problem there. For me personally, I think we need to tackle the issue of the overloads um, at the different times of the day and mm. try to even them out. Mm. Because otherwise, and how how would continue. you go about that? Um, I've literally just mentioned, you know, given an idea uh, without wanting to go into so much detail, um, is that, um, look, like I've said, businesses in manufacturing and uh, individuals have to split power. Their consumptions are at different rates. I'm just giving you hints here. The consumptions are at different rates. Those consumptions are not all in one part of the day and we do need to find a way of spreading this properly so that the load at the night time is not the same as it currently is that's all i'm saying so would you move these businesses to the night time because that is the, okay so that is the system that per pertains now businesses do most of these manufacturing companies apart from those who work around the clock they power their, their machines during the day and yeah. then we have um, individuals consuming mainly at night. But because yes. of 
things like street lights and what have you peak demand is at night so daniel I, we don't the street lights don't even work well, yes, of course, that's another <laughs> conversation. Uh, but but, don't even work. but the point the point I'm making is that we use more power at night, and, and that is what pertains now. That is because of individual, largely um, because of the domestic side. Yes, side largely. Of things. So how, largely. how do we even it out? There? So uh, what I'm saying is that how how can we do that? Not how can we not do that by moving some of the domestic use out of out of the process, out of the way. So how will you be moving? So the getting people use out into of employment way? in the night. I mean, because if you're not at home, you won't be using power. And I think people in the industry know this, that, you know, a huge chunk of, uh, you know, the, the night uh, uh, overrun is, is from domestic usage. But if they are not working, if they are not at home at night, then they are working at night. That means that they are using power in their offices. Commercial consumption is sometimes higher than domestic consumption. Sometimes higher than domestic yes. When you're looking at the number of domestic, um, um, the, the number of homes you have to power to power one factory or one company for to power Joy FM, for instance, you realize that it's it's uh, for a unit basis, it's much higher. It, it could be much higher. I'm not disputing that. The, the point I'm making is this: Look, um, we do need to find a way of reducing domestic use, and and in my view, um, and these are companies that work largely in the day and not in the night. My question is this, um, or my, my view about this is this. Is there a way, and this is something for exploring. I'm not saying it's a definite thing that can be done or should be done. I'm saying it's something that can be explored. Is that can we find a way of ensuring that, look, we somewhat, somehow, and I, and I think these things are doable, to move domestic consumption or reduce its usage in the night by getting them um, out into, into, into organizations that would allow them to work at night. Currently, you know, every company works in the daytime and then they shut down, and that's it. Um, and I do feel that, you know what, if, if we're saying that a large majority of energy uh, uh, upsurge happens within the domestic sector, not, not within the industry sector, within the domestic sector, then we do need to find a way of, of evening it out. So I'm not saying it's a definite solution, but it is one of the solutions that nobody seems to be talking mm, about. Mm. Which is why, you see, the question I was asking, going down that was because the question I was asking was that, say, you are president today, what would you be, how would you be solving the problem we have uh, for, you know, the next 10 to 12 day power outage? And, of course, the legacy problem we have that, right. you know, Doomsaw is becoming a bit, or the power outages are becoming a bit more cyclical, which is the, really, that's the question I'm asking. Right. Um, First of all, I mean, there's been uh, news out there already, uh, uh, which is that PDS, which is the new uh, uh, management team, hasn't largely uh, been fair to consumers. Um, I think one of the things I would expect PDS to do immediately would be to get consumers, or in fact the energy ministry, is to in fact be open to consumers and say, you know what, um, there is going to be power outages, because currently people don't know that. Um, and I think people have the right to know. The the anger I am hearing over the uh, the airwaves this morning and since last night, I, I had power outages as well, um, is not so much as the fact that Doomsaw is happening. I think people are angered by the fact that, you know, they have been sidelining all of this. There is no information out there. Uh, there are arguments. People say that there is information. Some say there isn't information. But largely, people are claiming that they don't even know that, you know, there was going to be power out and therefore they cannot plan their lives. I feel that out of respect, if for nothing at all, uh, that is at least the list of the things we should be able to give consumers is to say, you know what, look, there is a problem. It is our problem. Uh, we're going to have to deal with this. Um, and therefore, in the next 12 days or 11 days, I think it's come down to 10 days now. In the next 10 days, we're going to have to deal with this as mm. a people. Bear with us and we will do our best to, you know. But I think it's that lack of communication that is getting people angered. So I'm not sure people are actually angered because it's, you know, doom so. I mean, if the government is honest in the fact that, you know, this doom so is because of the linkages between the pipelines, then realistically, we can expect this to be over in 10 days. And 10 days is, is not an awful lot of time, but people do need to, to plan their lives. And I think, I think it'll be fair to people to, and that's basic customer service, I was saying to somebody yesterday. It is basic customer service. Um, I don't know what internally um, is the issue, uh, whether or not 
it is indeed the linkages that are causing the problem because that's just about a, a few uh, 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 sorry uh, sorry a few um, uh, well, of the plants mm -hmm. a few of the, of the plants, plants. Mm -hmm. right so you know and the excess energy uh, capacity we have is not just from those few plants if you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. so the question is do those few plants drastically cut down the power uh, uh, level we have that it has to be so widespread i don't know what the details are on the ground and i need to know those figures to be able mm. to answer that question mm. So one of the issues that has been plaguing the energy sector, if mm. you can stay there, and of course it's 25 minutes past eight. My guest this morning is, is, is Marik Kofi Ghani. He, is, uh, he has declared that he would want to run for president on an independent ticket. So before we go into you know the details of his declaration, we are dealing with some of the key issues that are facing Ghanaians today, exploring those alternative solutions that Marik has. Now, the the conversation around our energy mix also goes into the contracts that we have entered into. I'll give you a typical example. Yeah. We are paying $35 million for gas we are not using because yes. the tie-in has not been done. $35 million a month. We are paying $25 million a month for excess capacity that we are not using, You're for not using. power plants that we are not using their power. So if you were to come in right now, what would you do? Or what's your understanding of these contracts? Uh, well, the, the contracts you're talking about are contracts that require that whether you use the uh, capacity or not that has been uh, produced, you still have to pay for them. Uh, that largely is the, the concept around that. Um, earlier on, I think it was um, midway or the last quarter of last year, my understanding was the government was really looking at this contract um, and whether or not some of them can be uh, re, uh, re, re looked at. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far that has happened. That will be something certainly I would want to look at. And, and whether or not it is possible to re, uh, re look at these contracts or renegotiate these contracts in such a way that it's no more. Um, because look, I, I mean, who I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I don't know how these contracts were negotiated. I, I don't know that for a fact. Um, but it is worrying that we will go into a contract of that nature, knowing very well that there is a high likelihood that we may not be able to spend all that power that will be generated and still be able to pay for it, whether we use it or not. Um, and that worries. And I would have assumed that for anybody going into such a contract, you would that should that should just hit you. Um, so. Um, for whatever reason those contracts were entered into, I don't know. Um, but I wouldn't assume that um, if I were to put people on the table and say negotiate a power deal uh, uh, for us, that they will come back and tell me that, you know what, uh, we've negotiated this deal, it's a good deal, and the essence of the deal is that they will generate power, we would use it, but even if we don't use it, we will pay for what they generate. You know, that's, that's inefficiency actually being factored into the negotiation process. Um, I can't answer for, you know, whoever d did those negotiations, unfortunately. Um, but I would not want to assume that, you know, that is something that will happen in, in my in my, uh, in my my jurisdiction. But, but that's a situation that we that have now. That is a now. situation, which yes. is why I'm saying, you know, because the contracts have already been negotiated, the best we can do is to go back to the table and see how best we can, we can, we can tweak it. You know, uh, contracts are not necessarily, uh, yes, they are signed, but it doesn't mean they are setting stone. Um, you can always go back and and make because look everybody that comes to the negotiation table has um, has something they want to gain out of it. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to play your best card forward and and let the other guys know that look we have your needs at hand and we think we can meet you midway. Um, and if it is for the long term, you know these are business people. They will understand that this is for the long term. So it's not like they are being ripped off or anything. Yes, currently it looks juicy to them, so it might be difficult to flinch out. But you know we do need to go back to the negotiation table for some of these contracts. Mm. Finally, um, a few a few more questions from the energy sector before mm. we go on. Um, what are your long term thoughts about our energy mix now. We now have four thousand yeah. seven hundred and seventy one megawatts. megawatts right. Our peak demand is two thousand six hundred. What what's your long term vision mm -hmm. when you look at uh, Ghana's energy sector? Right. Um so uh, one of the things that I've always um, been on my mind is uh, we, I, I think several years back, uh, about a decade ago, we made a decision that we want to, wanted to introduce uh, green energy into the mix. Um, so we, I think we set the limit at just 5%. 
that hasn't happened. It hasn't even, we haven't even reached 3%. Um, that'll be one area I would love to explore um, or to give some consideration to. Um, in terms of the, uh, bearing the figures you've just put out, in terms of the usage, um, I would want to see, and again, I go back to this um, uh, agenda of we do need to figure out if there's a way we can spread the usage. Um, I, 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 I'm not an energy person, okay, um, but I want to believe there should be a way of getting around the peak usage at night. There, there certainly has to be. I mean, it, I mean, if this is not happening now, we wouldn't have known that you know the, the peaks at night, and therefore you know the usages go beyond what we we capable of uh, at that time of the day. But if now we know, the question is why aren't we going back to the table to figure out the way out of it? So. In the long term, one of the things I would like to really, really uh, put my mind to is to get a team together to say, you know what, can we figure out what is the best way to even out the mm. usage over, mm. over, that, over that period? Because when, it is crucial. When you mentioned um, that alternative about getting companies to work at night, I, I got a message uh, from a listener who says, uh, and you know, the average is that every worker has four dependents. And so he right. says that whilst I'm, at, uh, whilst I'm working, I have four dependents at home turning on the lights, watching television, right. still consuming power. So I understand. having the breadwinners at work does not exactly eliminate domestic I usage. agree. I agree. I'm not saying it totally eliminates it. What I'm saying is that at least we start to get it down to a certain level. Government has decided to introduce private participation with the introduction of PDS. What are your thoughts on this move? Is it, is it a smart move? It, 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 you see, the thing about energy is, I mean, or, or any other contract for that matter, it is a smart move only if it delivers a better efficiency than, um, than if it was just being run by uh, the public sector. Um, so if it is not developing, oh, sorry, if it is not uh, delivering efficiency, then, you know, it is not a good move. Now, the question then arises, can you determine whether it's, um, it's delivering efficiency before you actually bring the people on board? And, and yes, there is assessments that can be done. You, people do assessment before they do investments. And, and, you know, it was up to us to have determined whether or not um, what are the options PDS is bringing, how do they want to do things that is different from uh, ECG, uh, how ECG used to do it. Because currently in people's minds, people don't feel that ECG, sorry, uh, PDS is doing a better job than ECG. And then that is a problem. So I don't have a problem with bringing private participation. Yes, I worry the level to which they're involved in it. Currently, it's about, what, 51%, 49 So, you know, at, at least Ghana Whites will still have some level of majority in there. And that's, that's reasonable. Um, so I don't think private sector participation in, in running uh, facilities is a problem, as long as... Um, we have uh, efficiency that is meant to be delivered. And, and of course, that means that government has to set those efficiency levels um, and bring them to book to, to deliver them. This was part of a Millennium Challenge Compact, yes. an agreement that we had already entered and we were already benefiting from. Anyone who drives on the N1, the George Walker Bush Highway, has yes. benefited from it. Given that fine balance, our need and support for development mm. and this option given us, what, what decision would you have taken? Sorry, let me get the question properly. We need money to develop. Yes. The MCC is, is, is part of an arrangement where we get support to develop. Yes. You are a president faced with that choice. Right. What decision do you make? Whether to take the money or whether to take the money. Yes, because the money came with the private participation. It's part of the compact. I don't, I don't dispute that. The, mm -hmm. the, the point is this. Look, um, and here's the thing with development funding. Mm -hmm. The offers would always be made every time. Um, you have to go to the table and decide whether this offer is right for me long term or not. Okay, um, so the question as to whether I will take it or not is not just, it's neither here nor there. It's for me to determine at the time when the offer is being made, is this the best for me long term? If it is not the best for me, then I need to reconsider that. Um, and if it's going to come in, yes, I'll get the money, but it's not going to deliver the value I think I have to get out of it. You see, I think the choices we've made in Ghana till date have bordered on, oh, the money is available, let's take it. 
or the money will solve this problem short term, so let's take it. We've never really figured out, look, do we need to make some high cho- high, uh, uh, sorry, hard choices here so that in the future we can benefit? And, and the way we've run, you know, uh, institutions or policy or, 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 or politics it has been largely short term. So we're not ready to tighten our belt. We're not ready to take hard decisions um, in order to um, arrive at future, um, future benefits. It, it's always been, oh, the money is here, let's take it. Or they're giving us the money and their donors or their development partners, let's take it. So... It, it's about making hard decisions, about making hard choices. Yes, it may not benefit us in the immediate term, but it will in the future, and therefore we will say no to it. Uh, we can't always be saying yes to money um, because it's not always about money, it's about value. So you would say no? I'm not saying I would say no. I'm saying that at the circumstance at which point the money was given, I would look at my options and say, look, if we refrain from this and try to do it ourselves, could we get there in another five years without this money? Maybe the money can get it done in two years, but could we get in five years without getting burdened by this this loan uh, uh, element? And if that is the case, then yes, we, we have to put that to the country and say, look, we can do this in five years, but without the loan, it's going to mean in the first two or three years we tighten our belt and get it done. And that's how that's how countries develop. You don't always develop because you, you're going for money, uh, loans. I'm not saying loans are not important. Loans are important. But over the long term, you've got to figure out whether this is the loan that is best for me over that long term period. Okay. But short termism is just getting... Uh, I, I, are you speaking from the general idea of privatizing the national assets or the specific case of delivering value for money in terms of switching ECG for PDS? I'm talking. You, I mean, you asked a question around With whether this, which this, is why I want um, to know what's the, the development. Answer. Right. I, I think it's. I think it cuts across both. Um, I mean, the PDS came out as a result of that process, mm-hmm. that earlier process. Mm-hmm. So it, it, they're not separate. Mm-hmm. They're not separate. So okay. um, that's the point I'm making. You know, okay. you you could have taken the money earlier, and you know. Uh, I was asking that mm. question because you see, you said earlier that it's on the minds of many Ghanaians that PDS is not delivering the value that they were expected to deliver when ECG was being switched. I hosted this show on a number of occasions where a number of people said that, look, if it is privatization that will make ECG more efficient, so be it. It was not a 100% call for privatization, but we did get those sentiments. Mm. So do you stand by the idea that PDS is not as efficient as ECG was? Um, I, I Look, we've got to be um, a bit realistic about this. Um, Granted that PDS has inherited the staffing of ECG, has inherited the systems of ECG, um, my understanding when PDS came in was that they were here to ensure that there was some increased level of efficiency in the way power was distributed. Um, So they were supposed to be focusing on the distribution element of of power and, and how to bring some efficiency along those. It would take quite you know, a, a number of things. Um, it will be assets that will be brought in or, or changed that are already in existence. Um, so the question largely is in twofold. Um, over the long term, can PDS deliver efficiency? And in the short term, can they manage any inefficiency that was handed over to them by, by, uh, by, uh, by ECG? I think what PDS is dealing with now is the short-term management of any efficiencies they have inherited. Um, And so it is not the same as the long-term efficiency they have been contracted to deliver. And I think we need to be, uh, um, you know, uh, fair on on both sides uh, differently. Uh, We can't mix the two because one is a short-term agenda, one is a long-term thing. Um, And I'm not sure we can say, you know what, because this is happening now, they may not be able to deliver long-term efficiency. Mm. So uh, I want to believe they were validated before they were brought in. So they've, you know, they've seen their capability. They've figured out, uh, or government has figured out that they can deliver uh, better value over the over the longer. So time. yes or no? Are they being uh, inefficient, or this is just what they inherited? Um, <laughs> I don't know what PDS is going through. I mean, I don't work for PDS. It would be hard to answer that question on behalf of PDS. But um, as a consumer, as, as a Ghanaian, as a, from what it looks outside. I I, th- I just think PDS is going through some difficulty managing the inefficiency they've inherited. Okay. 
because they're still early days if you if you if, if we're being fair about it yeah of course they took over somewhere in march yes uh, it's 21 minutes to the top of the hour. You're still live on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. My name is Daniel Daze. Our guest today is Marek Kofi Ghani. Marek has declared his intention to run for president as an independent candidate. And so we are dealing with the issues that President Ekufado has to deal with each and every day. And we are uh, finding out what the alternatives are, according to Marek and, of course, I'm sure his team. Uh, the CD Marek is selling this morning, the dollar is selling this morning, morning for five cds 49 pesos this is one of the worst um values we have seen in in recent weeks i mean if you're looking at the recent mm. bout of depreciation uh, we saw very good numbers sometime last week it slipped back um in your view what's going on <laughs> um i don't think there's any one thing that we can point to regarding uh, the slippage of the uh, the cd I, I think there's a, a number of factors that go into the city slipping in and out uh, from time to time um uh from time to time so um you know we can't look at it from just one perspective um Largely, I I feel, and everybody has said this, um, and I I want to deviate a little bit. Uh, so many people have said it's the fact that we import more than we export, and rightfully so. That is right. I mean, I'm not disputing that. Um, I also feel that look, we're not um, creating value domestically, um, and by that I mean. We've always been talking about uh, industrialization. And what it means is that we're able to produce locally, uh, consume it locally, and then whatever is the excess we can export. On a large scale, none of that is happening. And so this is more a long-term thing than a short-term thing. Um, every year, we go in and bring in uh, the COCO syndicated loan. Of course, it's going to affect how you know uh, the exchange rates uh, work out. It might reduce it for a short-term period. Mm -hmm. But then once that gets utilized in the system or gets uh, 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 diffused into the system, you know, the old long-term problem comes back up. So um, it's not a short-term thing. It's not a one-angle thing. I think there's several things that need to be looked at. But largely, I think we should start looking at how we can deliver value uh, 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 domestically. And that is, you know, if we want to do industrialization, let's go ahead and do industrialization. Are you suggesting industrialization as a solution? I'm suggesting that we are not producing enough. And therefore, as long as that remains, we would continue um, having a problem. Look, the, the thing about the currency is this. The currency is largely a reflection of productivity. If the U.S. is slipping higher above the CD, it's largely because, you know, productivity in the U.S., um, uh, if you're matching the two countries, is higher than what we're getting in, in, in Ghana. So, you know, there's, there's, we don't, we don't, we, I, I think people need to stop making this argument that, you know, the CD is just something that happens on its own. The CD or the dollar is largely a reflection on your productivity in any country, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's in uh, uh, Togo CFA or whether it's in uh, the, the GBP pound. So, um so it's not it's not a matter of you know the city is doing this or the city is doing that. The question is, are we you know locally or even uh, domestically, are we being productive enough? Because as long as you remain unproductive, the, the city is going to you know reflect that compared to other countries. Okay, on the question of imports versus exports, mm. that was the first puzzle of this particular bout of depreciation, mm. because we are seeing more exports than imports, yeah. um, as we saw. I mean, you know this. We yes. had a trade surplus last year. So when you say we are increasing productivity, what specifically are you talking about? When I say we are increasing productivity, uh, okay. So you've mentioned exports and and the rest. Let me let's let's, let's make it practical then. One of the biggest ex uh, sorry imports we've had in the last couple of years is is and as is everybody, it's on everybody's mind is rice. Correct. Right. Why why aren't we producing enough to match the demand? Because the the import is happening because there is a demand for it. The question I have, and I've always asked this, is what is the investment we're making into the production of rice? Because if we're going to topple that import, we've got to be able to match the demand that is driving that import. 
Okay, so the question is quite simple. What are we doing investment-wise to ensure that, you know, we're, we're producing rice to the point that over the future it will be enough to topple over the, uh, the import uh, that we are, we are experiencing? That is the question. Um, we talk about other forms of uh, 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 investment coming into the country. Um, how are we, for example, dealing with our human resource? to the point that the quality of the human resource is enough to drive uh, business ventures into Ghana that say, you know what, we think, I'll give you an example. Just recently, a lot of the uh, cloud computing organizations globally are moving to South Africa because, you know, uh, the labor force there, they feel is technically ripe enough for their businesses to do well in that kind of environment. So, again, the question is not literally just about the, the, the city or the dollar. Um, an example of that question would be, how are we treating our human resource? How are we developing our human resource? That will cause investors to question and say, you know what, that's going to have the, the, the right technical know-how or in, in terms of human resource enough for us to relocate to Ghana. Uh, and, and cite our businesses there. And once the business is coming here, then that adds to productivity. So the productivity question is not a one-phase question. It has to be tackled on, on several levels. Uh, and as I've just explained, it has to be tackled from an educational perspective. Um, as I've explained, it has to be tackled from an agricultural perspective. Um, there are issues around infrastructure, for example, because you know the better infrastructure, coordinated infrastructure you have, the, the lower the, the pricing of items, and therefore when you export into the international market, you export at competitive rates. Uh, so, the, the, like I keep saying, you know, the, the economy is not a standalone thing. The economy mm. is a reflection, mm. or even our currency is mm. a reflection of every other area mm. we have developed. Uh, you see, I, I'm asking the questions the way I'm asking them because mm. um, for every one of the... For every one of the issues that you raise, mm. for instance, if you talk about rice production, yes. rice is one of the crops that is being considered under the Planting for Food and Jobs program. Yes. The Planting for Food and Jobs program is feeding national buffer stock, which is feeding free SHS. Mm -hmm. um, at least that is the that's policy, domestic user, that's yes. the policy framework as we have right. If you talk about human resource um, improvements, this mm. government will point you to free SHS. Free SHS. And, and right. yes, because, I mean, an investment in education is an investment in your human resource. Wait, hold on. Um, the long term. Just, just so we get it clear there. Let me finish okay. the question. Yeah. Let me finish the question. Mm. So what I am asking, and, and then you talk about general productivity. We can talk about industrialization, one district, one factory. So what, what are the key policy uh, guidelines that you want to start on? That are different. That would work. Okay. Uh -huh. um, uh, Dan, I can't. I mean, I'm, I keep saying this on many shows I've been on. Is that I, it will be hard for me to talk about policy issues now because you know this is not a campaign season. Um, hopefully, you understand that. Um, but the why, why not? <laughs> but <laughs> well, it, it is. It is what it is. You know, uh, we're not in campaign drive, so I can't. You know, that's when you put out your manifestos and the details of your manifestos. But what I can say to you is this. Um, you talk about free SHS, for example. That is a quantity issue. So you've increased the number of uh, kids who now go into the second cycle school. That's, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, that is, that is something that should have been guaranteed. It has been guaranteed by the Constitution, so it should have happened. So I don't have a problem with increased in the number of students who go into uh, free SHS. The question you and I should ask is whether or not when the kids come out on the other end out of university, they have the quality of education that a business, say, in the U.S. would look at and say, you know what, I think these guys are doing well with, you know, uh, how their human resources are aligned to technology. So can we move Google there? Or can we, sorry, not Google. Can we move uh, uh, eBay there? Or can we move uh, some other company there, Alibaba there? You know, so... It's not really a quantity issue. Um, so free SHS is a quantity issue. What I'm talking about is a quality issue. Okay. So your your idea is to improve on a quality basis. And, the, and it's, it's the, an idea I'm personally very, very, very passionate quality about. Quality that is globally matched. That that can match global global uh, uh, levels, if, if you get what I mean. Yeah, but, but you see, you see and, and that is why... I'd like us to be specific because, again, <laughs> the three key legs of free SHS are access, quality, and equity. Are we seeing the quality? And, that's no, the thing. So what are we doing? Okay. Because that, you see, you see, Mark, that is where the okay. difference uh, let me, let me, let me, Let me not, without talking about policy, let me, let me give you a very practical example. Okay. I'm an accountant. 
Um, and mm-hmm. I've given this example somewhere. I'm an accountant, for example. Okay. Um, let's say an accounting student goes to school, goes through, you know, uh, university, goes all the way to the end, comes out, you know, BS, whatever, uh, accounting. Um, I would have loved to see something like this. You've got, you're going to spend three years in school or four years in some cases. It would have been really good. This is my viewpoint. It would have been really good that as part of your curriculum of accounting, for example, there is an element in that allows you to what? Study how accounting systems work or even practice how accounting systems work. You know, I mean, universities have labs. The question is, are those labs even open to accounting students, for example? Can they go in there and study how uh, an accounting software works? The trick about that is that they come out on the other end not only having a theoretical understanding of how accounting works, but can actually put it into practice. The benefit for the businessman, for example, is that he does not have to employ this guy and then spend another one year helping him understand how um, uh, software works or generally how accounting systems work in practice. All right. That that already cuts down his cost of investing in that uh, human resource extra-wise. So, um, and people like that who come out that way, a business person would, would look at our curriculum and say, oh, actually, you know what? If I go to Ghana and invest in a business down there and employ this guy, for example, um, I don't have to spend one year paying him salaries just to teach him how to use an accounting system. Because he already learned that in school. It might cost me just six months of that instead of two years. So um, as basic as it looks, it, 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 it functions across board. It, it would help the person himself. It will help the economy itself. It will help businesses who want to come and invest here. And that is what drives businesses uh, to, mm. to come to co- countries. So mm. it's not so much about businesses uh, saying, you know, we've seen the fundamentals. They look good and therefore we're running. They look for practical things like that. Uh, and large amongst them is the human factor. Mm. So that deals with one of the main elements of your your ideas with dealing with the economy. Um, in, you mentioned industrialization and agric, and my I'm reminded of the fact that those are not our highest earning sectors anymore. We now have a lot from the service industry. Right. Mm. And the question we should ask is why have they dropped? Because our Greek used to be one of our highest uh, 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 produ- uh, pro- contributing uh, uh, sectors to our GDP. The question is, what we've literally just sat down and watched it drop. So now that we are where we are, and a service economy does drive nations, they are play- they are, uh, Switzerland, for I instance, agree. banks the world. Purely. Exactly. So right. Where where are we? Should we switch the service industry? Should we look at industrialization again? I have I have I have, I have I have um, I have written an article on this in the past, um, where I have said, you know what, as a country, it would have been good to notice that without any intervention by government itself, the service industry has overtaken the uh, agri sector. Why aren't we asking ourselves, oh, what happened there? How can we leverage that natural progression? It's already starting itself. So why, how can we leverage that? My view was simply this, and it's still my view, um, is that we should be doing a lot more of encouraging innovation industry. Um, and I'll give you a very practical example. What is the right one, or I'm allowed to use that? It's a different debate. But... Um, just yesterday, I saw um, M Pedigree winning a school award. Mm. Um, M Farmer, right? Our friends, yeah. Well, f- congratulations to them. Uh, uh, and and then M Farmer, which is also a Ghanaian company, has won the school award. That's not a cheap award. It isn't. Um, I do feel we have a population that is highly youthful, very energetic. We don't seem to worry too much about whether or not we can leverage that uh, youthful exuberance into creating a whole new economy around technology. And for me, that is a crucial thing. Because, look, if you look at our neighbors, for example, I think we, we have a huge competitive advantage in terms of if we chose to develop our youth um, in that line. And that's one of the things I, I critically want to look at. Um, and, I, and I think it's crucial we do that. Mm. Um, at six minutes to the top of the hour here on the Super Morning Show, enjoy 99.7 FM. Some news just coming in. An old man feared dead after being hit by a car at Flamingo Junction, Matahiko. There's an old man who is feared dead after being hit by a car 
at Flamingo Junction at Matahiko. The police is needed at the scene immediately to help us out. The police is needed at the scene immediately to help us out. It's still live on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM. There are a number of questions coming in from our listeners and there are a number of issues that we are dealing with. My guest this morning is Myrick Kofi Ghani. He has declared that he will be running for president in 2020 as an independent candidate. How is that going to happen? Myrick will tell us when we come back. At AfroDan, we believe that many of the problems people have with their health is as a result of the way they sit. In other words, your chair can kill you. Here's Dr. Marcus Mann of the Chiropractic and Wellness Center. What you have to remember is that the spine is the lifeline to your body. And posture is the window to that spine. Now, posture is affected by your daily activities and habits like sitting. That's why at the Chiropractic and Wellness Centers, we recommend what I believe to be the best chairs available for preventing not only subluxations, but also other health problems that you may not be aware of. And that's Rabami and Mobilex chairs. Unfortunately, on a daily basis, I have to correct the effects of this poor sitting habit in our business men and business women. Always remember, optimal spine equals optimum health. So, for the sake of your health, buy Robami or Mobilex chairs from Afrodan. We're on the first floor of the Swansea Shopping Arcade. Telephone 663-085. Hey, Kwame, hmm. what's up here? My brother, my wife has been diagnosed with cancer. What? Uh, my brother is here with kidney disease too. Oh, yeah. Do you know the World Health Organization estimates that over 16,000 new cases of cancers are diagnosed annually in Ghana and kidney diseases account for 10% of all medical admissions to Kolebu? But thanks to Glycocritical Illness Plan, Jason, I have spent over 20,000 Ghana cities on my younger brother's disease. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is GSIP? Glycocritical Illness Plan, GSIP, provides you with financial support when diagnosed with any critical illness or dread disease such as cancers, strokes, kidney failures. Speak to Glycolife today on 0302-218-500 for your GSIP policy. It is definitely in our interest to survive. Glycolife, we cushion you for life. The world is a very special place, filled with so many special moments. Enjoy special food, meet special people, and visit special sites. With so many special destinations to explore, your journey can be special too. With Emirates, wait for it, special fares. Book by 9th April for travel until 30th September 2019. Visit emirates.com slash gh. Conditions apply. Fly Emirates. Fly better. Roverman Productions in partnership with Joy FM and National Theatre presents a brand new Ebo White play titled Dora. Why? All right, everyone calm down. Nobody panic. Now tell me what is going on. Look, someone has been here. The dining table has been laid. I didn't do it, but see... And, and they left a note on the table as well. What does it say? Let me take a look. It says, good evening, Thomas and Mabel. Yes, sir. Today marks the 30th anniversary of my death. What? This is to keep my memory alive. Please don't forget me. Signed, Dora. Jesus! <laughs> Actually, it's written here. <laughs> Venue is National Theatre. Time is 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. each day. Dora! Why? Shows on 6th and 7th April and the Easter weekend, 20th, 21st, and 22nd April 2019. Tickets available at Joy FM, Shell Shops at Airport, Tema Community 11, and Dansuman, Bachina, and Hachatota, Frankie's, Osu, and all usual outlets. Hotline 050 554 6010. Sponsors Bond Savings and Loans, Sikol Ghana Limited, Old Mutual, and Dolphin Finance. Media Partners Hits FM, Joy News, Joy Prime, Adum TV, MyJoyOnline.com, and AdumOnline.com. Dora, why? Buy your tickets now. Providence Insurance, insurance for Marine. Providence Insurance, insurance for your motor. Providence Insurance, insurance for your property. Providence Insurance, your future happy days. With Provident, man, you are covered. 
Welcome to South Africa, your own personal playground. Welcome to the Cape Wine. Welcome to Johannesburg. Welcome to Shaka Marine World. Welcome to Canal World. Welcome to the Nelson Mandela Capture Site. Welcome to Welcome to the Cape Town Jazz Festival. Welcome to the Welcome to Mabu. Welcome to East London. Welcome to God's Window. With 54 million welcoming South Africans, all eager to make your holiday that much more inviting, allow us to indulge you with all our favorite sights and sounds. Visit South Africa. Africa.net to discover more. South Africa, inspiring new ways. Hello, it's the Joy Business Minute with me, Daryl. The amount businesses and industries spend on power is expected to increase in the coming days. The Ghana Grid Company has asked the power distribution services to shed power for some 12 days. Meanwhile, the country will reduce its reliance on gas supply for power generation from Nigeria by the end of the month. This follows the ongoing interconnection work at the Ottawa Gas Processing Facility by Ghana Gas, which has resulted in the intermittent power supply. Some major oil marketing companies have started reducing prices at the pumps. Shell and Total have all dropped their prices. Following the review, a litre of diesel is going for 5 CDs 18 pesos and petrol for 5 CDs 16 pesos. It's official. The country will today end its four-year fund program with the IMF after passing the seventh and eighth review carried out by the staff. The board of the fund is expected to sign off the necessary documents to finalize the exit. Those are the latest updates. Good morning. Hello, Corporate Ghana. It's the fourth Ghana CEO Summit, a unique two-day world-class business conference to be held on the 20th and 21st of May, 2019 at Kempinski. Theme. Futuristic Economy, Technology-Driven Future of Business and Governance for Economic Transformation. This summit has been a real success and has attracted over 1,500 dignitaries, including His Excellency, President Nana Akufoadu. For registration and sponsorship, visit ghanaceosummit.com or call 054-639-1970. Powered by CEO Network Ghana and Deloitte. I remember that day our neighbor drove up with this brand new car. <laughs> Charlie. It was 1994. I was but a teenager with big dreams and small means. I watched this new car they labeled SUV from my bedroom window for hours on end. But that night, I went to sleep thinking, one day, I'm gonna buy me one just like it. Fast forward to now as we speak, I'm on my way to the showroom to pick up that dream SUV. My very own Kia Sportage. Woo! Drive up today with your brand new Kia Sportage at a discounted price. Ghana's favorite SUV since 1994. For more info, call 0249-911-444 or visit any of our Kia showrooms in Accra, Tema, Spintas, Takradi or Kumasi. Kia, the power to surprise. Past nine here on the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. A guest in the studio is Marek Kofi Gan, who has declared that he will be running for president as an independent candidate in 2020. A few messages coming through. Okay, OPK from Sakumono says, Hello, Daniel. Our lights are on. Um, we have power in Sakumono. Because B. Anthony says, listening to your conversation now and want to wade in, do we import from China or from the USA? The last time I checked, the U.S. imports imports highly from China too. This is what Donald Trump is trying to change, but that's my addition. I think we are rather not creating a value for our city. Japan, Poland, Dubai, Nigeria, China and others are all trading in the U.S. currency, but the value of their currency is stable and traded with domestically. We trade domestically 
uh, with more than one currency and the demand for the others outweighs the city. We should tackle the problem from that angle first. Marcos Biantini, thanks for that input. PDS is a private entity and Ghanaians are the customers. The best they can do as a service delivering entity is to render good customer service from inform your customers about the scheduled blackouts. It boils down to good customer service. So we haven't finished totally dealing with the power issues, I mean, on the show. And so we would have um, the energy ministry speak with us before the show is over. But uh, we are still here with Marek Khan. And we have been talking about the energy situation and the economy. We'll talk about health and then corruption. But before that, Kingdom Books and Stationery offers a 30-day credit facility with no interest charge. We deliver free within Accra, Tema and surrounding towns. Call us on 0302-764101 or 7623-07. Visit KingdomGH.com. Kingdom Books and Stationery Limited, your number one stop shop for all office essentials, stationery and furniture. Now, Rover One Productions, in partnership with Joy FM and National Theatre, present a brand new original Ebo White play titled Dora. Why? Dora has been dead for 30 years, yet Reverend and Mrs. Soa find this note. Good evening, Thomas and Mabel. Today marks the 30th anniversary of my death. This is to keep my memory alive. Please don't forget me. Signed, Dora. Is this note really from Dora? If not, who is behind this cruel prank? And what does he or she want of Reverend and Mrs. Soa? The play shows at the National Theatre this weekend, 6th and 7th of April 2019, and next two weekends, that's the Easter weekend, 20th, 21st and 22nd of April 2019 at 4pm and 8pm each day. The rate is 80 Ghana cities. Early bird tickets have been exhausted. You can go this weekend if you have an early bird ticket, or you can come to Joy FM for your ticket, or you can call 050-554-6010, or WhatsApp 050-554-6030. Or email tickets at rovermanproductions.com. Roverman Productions, be the difference. Still live on the Super Morning Show, Joy 99.7 FM. Uh, so I have a texter who says his policy idea in improving human resource of the country is to make his people employees of eBay and Google and not creators of similar businesses. <laughs> uh, you want to respond to that, Mark? Um, that was not what I said. What I said was that, I mean, every, every country does have business investments from external sources. I mean, it's normal for every country. I did not say I wanted to make my people slaves to uh, uh, eBay or, or all the rest. What I did say was that if we were to develop the quality of our education to the level that it had international uh, 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 quality standards, then we not only open up ourselves to have uh, good investments coming in, but even domestically, it becomes useful for us as a people. Businesses here domestically can benefit from the, the same quality uh, uh, educational material. So um, I was not saying, you know, purely that on the basis that, you know, uh, my people would become workers of uh, eBay and the rest. Mm. That's not what I'm saying. Mm. Okay, so... Um, in 2015, a technical committee set up by the then government found that uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme is not delivering what it should be delivering. A number of ideas came up. This year, we learned that the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital uh, is owed some 6 million Ghana cities. What's your solution? To the NHIS? Or? Yes, the right. NHIS is challenging. Right. Um, I have always reiterated that there is the need to look at, relook at the funding structure of the NHIS um, and whether or not it is sustainable or not. Um, I don't believe that it currently is. Um, and my view is, and a lot of these questions that are coming, you know, are things that uh, you do need to be in the NHIS to figure out what is happening in there. Um, it's difficult to look at it from the outside with very, very uh, scanty information. 
Um, that said, I do feel there is a need, and this is something I have always said I would want to look at, is to take a second look at the, the funding structure of the NHIS and how it feeds into the uh, the whole hospital structure um, across country. So um, I do feel there are some inefficiencies there from you know n only news that I have heard over the while. Um, and those inefficiencies need to be looked at. Uh, so that, for now, is what I can see from outside, and those are areas I would want to cover. It's largely to look at the inefficiencies that exist and how best to deal with them, uh, and largely to take a second look at the, the, the funding structure uh, within the NHIS. Those inside the NHIS agree with the issues of the funding structure. They want a higher levy. Do you agree? Um. It's one thing to demand for a higher levy. It's another thing to to answer the question whether those higher levies are translating into uh, uh, good value being delivered for those paying the higher levies. I mean, it's just normal that if you're paying a higher levy, you should be getting a higher quality of service. So until we can settle on the fact that in those inefficiencies are being uh, cuddled out or have been reduced... Bringing in more money is not going to increase the delivery of service. And I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's quite basic to, to, to capture. Uh, bringing more money, that's fine. Inefficiency still still exists. You're not going to get quality uh, uh, on the other what side. What are the inefficiencies you'd like to iron out? The inefficiencies relate to how... Uh, Largely, currently, the NHIS deal with hospitals. Uh, uh, there are inefficiencies around, uh, say, for example, how payments are being delayed to hospitals. Um, and mind you, what it means is that the longer it takes to make payments, for example, to hospitals or to pharmacies for supplying uh, drugs and all that, they incur costs on those uh, uh, activities. What the NHIS doesn't seem to realize is that the increasing cost for those uh, parties to deliver those services gets transferred back into the cycle. Because, look, if I am getting my monies late, in between when I get my money and when I actually deliver the service, I need to borrow money. If I borrow money, it means that I'm going to incur interest. I can't take that interest on my own. It has to pass on. And if it passes on, it means that the next cycle would mean higher costs. So it will keep increasing until some of these inefficiencies get um, eye on that. I'm not saying it's the only inefficiency. What I'm saying is that that is one inefficiency that is very obvious. Um, there are others, I believe, that need to be looked at and dealt with accordingly. Uh, but until those inefficiencies are dealt with, I do not believe for one minute that you know we should be... Uh, talking about higher levies, you know, I, I think we need to start respecting uh, citizenry in that regard, that if you're getting to pay more, you should be getting a higher level of service. By the way, Kofi Ntema says you already have his vote. And there's an Okuku <laughs> Seku who says that um, he wants to know where your campaign office is. He wants to volunteer. But before we get to those, before <laughs> we get you. to those details, you know, you name delaying payments as an inefficiency. But NHIS will tell you, if you give us more money, we won't delay the payments. <laughs> That's what NHIS says. Oh, yes. When they went on the nationwide, um, the nationwide um, consultation. I suppose the question that should be asked NHIS is um, whether or not the monies they have gotten so far, they have delivered, uh, you know, corresponding value for them. And if they haven't, then there needs to be, you know, they have to answer that question. I mean, nobody should be just throwing money because they're demanding more money. Uh, so it's neither here nor there that, you know, NHIS says give us more money and therefore uh, we'll just jump and give them more money. The question is, you're, you're there to deliver a service. You have been, it's not like they haven't been giving money, you know, so they have been giving some but money. is that money enough? The review in 2015 said it is not. The review in 2015 yes, says the money is not. after 10 years of implementation, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, I haven't read that report, um, as you've put it. Um, I haven't read that report. I don't know the details of it. It would be good to see whether that report, apart from saying that the money is not enough, um, also has in there to what extent or how far the monies they have received uh, can uh, deliver some level of service and what level of service it can deliver. Only then can we begin to figure out 
um, to what level of uh, accountability do we hold them if we give them more money? Because, look, the thing is this. If you're getting X million today and you are delivering X value today and you want more money, the question is, do you want Y amount of money to deliver a new level of Z in terms of, uh, of quality? If that is not going to happen, or if there can be any guarantee from the NHIS that when we get X amount, Y amount of money, we will be able to deliver Z level of, of, of quality uh, compared to what we currently deliver, then that question of getting or wanting more money shouldn't even come in. So it, it's a two-way affair. Yes, NHIS can say we want more money, but they should also be giving us a guarantee to say, you know what, giving us more money would mean that we are, we are putting ourselves forward to deliver this level of quality that we are not delivering currently. It's interesting. There was also the the suggestion that perhaps we are spreading ourselves too thin with the number of diseases that we are covering, and so some of them should be removed. Do you think it's a good idea? I think that is done in every jurisdiction. The NHIS or the National Health Insurance does not cover everything. Um, I, I mean, largely most of our diseases are largely lifestyle diseases, uh, lifestyle-related diseases. So... Um, I don't believe for a second that in any jurisdiction uh, the NHIS or the National Health uh, Insurance covers every single disease because um, that would be drawing too high on the, uh, the deliverability of the NHIS because, look, some, treating some diseases are way more expensive than treating others. Um, and we need to come to a point where we start to figure out what are the common ones and what are the uh, price levels for, for having uh, to be solved or to be, to be cured. Um, and then determine, you know what, these are the levels we can deal with. Um, in case you do want to uh, deal with it at a higher level or the diseases are of a higher nature or of a more complex nature, you know, then private schemes will come into the picture. But there is nowhere in the world where, you know, the NHIS or the, the, the public uh, health insurance policy covers every single disease. It doesn't happen anywhere. 16 minutes past nine here on the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. My guest this morning is Myrick Kofi Ghani. Gan. We have uh, Gan. Sorry, the name is Gan. Myrick Kofi Gan. <laughs> yes. Thank you. We've dealt with um, energy. We've dealt with the economy. We've talked a bit about health with a, a quick touch on education. He sounds intelligent. But the moment he gets power, hmm. I don't know why it's only opposition parties and individuals that have brains to govern the country. But once they get power, they forget them all. Nene is texting from London. First of all, I say kudos to Mike for the bold step he's taken. Though the journey will be tough. I want to assure him he has the an unconditional thinker like him. What, has, what he has declared is doable. He shouldn't lose focus, but he should know some of us are strongly behind him and can't wait to be part of the team. Evans from Kumase. Quite a cult hero Mar- Marik is becoming this morning. Let's talk about corruption now. Oh, dear. <laughs> What's the solution? Big ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, look, um, I feel corruption has to be dealt with on different levels. Um, for me, the first level is that it has to start with me. It has to start at the highest office. Um, it is the only way I would have any moral jurisdiction whatsoever to even question somebody below um, at the operational level of governance why they are uh, being corrupt. So, in my view, corruption has to start at that very highest level. And, I, and I've and i always said I put myself forward to that uh, for total uh, uh, disallowance of corruption within my environment. Um, so that is the moral side of it because that gives the moral jurisdictions to enforce, you know, corruption uh, 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 issues around, uh, around the country. That's one. The uh, going further from that, I feel there has to be some level of uh, enforceability uh, uh, around corruption. And for me, it boils down to two things. On the one hand, I, and this is one of the, I feel, benefits of running as an independent uh, uh, person, is that it minimizes the political influence in the exercise of our laws um, and the extent to which those laws can go to punish perpetrators of um, either corruption or theft or, 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 um, or any of the other uh, financial uh, uh, issues. So 
um, first of all, it has to start with me. Second, I think I want to lose um, influence or political influence over the exercise of, of, our, of our legal jurisdictions. Uh, that's two. The third thing I want to consider in terms of uh, uh, dealing with corruption is to, at all levels, make the price of uh, benefiting from corruption uh, exceedingly higher than the uh, the the benefits of not engaging in corruption. Um, currently, you know, it's 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 we're still yet to find any high profile, for example, case that have been proven corruption wise, and that somebody have been punished, and that it sends a shiver down the spine of anybody who wants to engage in corruption. Uh, and it goes back to the point I made that corruption or dealing with it has to start at a very high level. Um, and so we do need to make the cost of corruption very high. It's the only way we're going to ensure that it, 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 it goes very way down. Um, so uh, those for me are pointers. Um, I don't think largely our version of corruption is, uh, is anything largely beyond uh, exercising of political will to ensure that the law takes its turn and, and gets things done. Um, I feel we have the laws to deal with corruption. Uh, yes, there needs to be an extension of those laws uh, wider into the uh, private sector, uh, and that's another thing that mm. needs to be considered. Mm. Uh, but largely, I feel it's a political will thing, um, um, and, and tightly connected to that political will is the interference of politics in how the law goes about dealing with corruption. Okay, so we, we have had some persons jailed. Uh, I remember... As a result of Manasseh's investigation yes. last year, um, Abu Gapele, Philip That's Hasebe, right. yes, yes, yes. A number of them were jailed. But I, I get the general point we are making. I'm going to read for you a quote made by Doha Jaho in 2015. Okay. He says, we have monetized our politics, all of us. If we don't pay, they won't vote for you. That is the fact. People point to this as a real cause of corruption. It is one of the causes of corruption. Um, the fact that you have to build a war chest to be able to uh, uh, influence votes. It also means that um, whilst you're in office, you do not have any major responsibility to the citizenry because you've actually paid them off for that responsibility. That largely is uh, one of the main causes. Uh, what an independent candidate brings to the picture is that it, is, it, it cannot be hand-tied to either political party who bring in the money from uh, the public or, or, or big spenders, um, and therefore whose hands get tied when they have to deal with corruption in the future. That is one big advantage that I feel that this process brings. Um, on the issue of whether or not that can be stopped, look, that is the way politics has been done so far. Everybody knows it's not the right way. But those involved in deep-seated politics also feel that that is the way it has worked and therefore that is the way it should continue to work. I don't believe for a minute that the people that pay these monies to, on a normal, they would want to take those monies and just vote. I think it's a largely survival instinct that, look, I don't have a job. No jobs are being created. These guys come along. They're putting some money. I want that money because I need to breathe the next day. I need to eat the next day. My children need to eat. So um, it's almost like a vicious cycle where the the inability of um, several administrations that have gone by to make the very large population of rural folks you know, uh, be able to create their own opportunities or unable to create their opportunities uh, fuels the process of them being able to buy the same votes when the time comes for elections. And I think that has got to stop. How will you fund the election? My election is not... So I have started this process with the mindset that it has to be an election... Uh, sorry, a, a campaign for the people and with the people. Um what I have learned and I do not want happening uh, in my campaign uh, when it does start is that I do not want my um, administration to be in any way hijacked. 
And by hijacked, I mean, I don't want any big players coming on board and saying, oh, well, there's just 15 of us. We can fund everything. Uh, we just need a shot at this when you get into power. That we do not want to do. Um, so it's largely going to come from well-meaning Ghanaians um, who are not interested in uh, the status quo as it is now and who are happy to put their you know, money's where their mouth is and say, you know what, I want to be part of this process because then you have a responsibility to me. So you'll be taking donations from Ghanaians? There will largely be opportunities for donations, yes. When you say there will largely be opportunities, what is the model for funding? Because I'm asking this question because, again... The model is, is, is the largely funding. donations from, from individuals and citizenry. And you have said that if someone comes to you with money and later he comes and says that, I'd like this contract, you would not... That's not the way we want to do this. Um, if, if you're giving money for these causes, believe you be, you, it's, because, it's because you believe that it's a, this, the season has come for us to change the way things have been done, the politics has been done so far. Um, so it is not a matter of us saying, oh, your money is big, let's take it. Um, one contract is no problem. We can give one contract. Okay, so that's not the way we want to deal with it. We certainly, uh, our, my team and I are certainly very certain that, you know, it's not the way we want to do it. Uh, and we're doing this largely because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways things have been done up to now that we want to do different. Um, and certainly funding is one of them. And so, no, we, it's not the way we want to go about it. In the run-up to the Talency by-election, um, Dr. Parkwitz mentioned that even though he's trying to appeal to the conscience of persons, people are sharing money and it's making it almost impossible for his candidates to win the election. Mm. What are your chances if you're not doing this? My chances are that the thinking is beginning to change, uh, largely, um, and if my announcement is anything to go by, I feel that there is beginning to gather a critical mass of people who believe that we cannot continue down this road. At this point, it will be hard to assess what the levels of that thinking are. But it's been very strong. It's been very, uh, uh, very forceful. Um, and it is up to us to to be able to make sure we deliver to the Ghanaian people the sort of change they are looking to, 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 to have. I, um, I am encouraged by the response to my announcement, um, and therefore it makes me believe that so far what we intend to do is, is largely acceptable. Um, I think even those who take money from politicians to vote are beginning to tire out of it because, look, every four years you take money, some money, not even a lot of money. Um, after the election, that money will not probably take you more than a month. And then you have to run for three and a half years or more on empty diesel or, or on empty resources. So I think even people who take money are beginning to realize that, you know what, there has to be a long-term element to all of this. It, it can't just be taking small bits of money that run out, you know, three or four days after the election, and then I'm back to where I've always been. And that is the message you want to drive to Ghanaians. And I'm sure that is the message those who believe that this process might work are also going to drive to Ghanaians. Is it enough to tip the scales, in your view? There is enough to cause a disruption that, depending on the Ghanaian people, may be irrecoverable. And that's my aim. I would come for the, an explanation of that <laughs> earlier. But this was to really get your understanding. Because, you see, it's been agreed across board that campaign financing and political party financing is one of the key issues that causes corruption. I agree. And yes. And, but we also can't ignore the fact that procurement as itself, as it yes. stands now. Is, I have a procurement expert sending me so many questions now. Good morning. You know yourself, I'll miss you. <laughs> um, the, the, the question is, what's your understanding of our procurement process now and what must be done differently? Uh, right. So somebody asks, actually, somebody f interestingly asked me a similar question. Um, largely now, I mean, and I have put a few things out there in social media in the past about procurements being done on a largely... Uh, 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 Colleague, colleague base, uh, even in the public sector. Um, my view of uh, public sector procurement is that currently, as it stands, there's a, there's a massive level of political influence in, in procurement. 
um, and I've put some news out there in the past, and I, I go to the, uh, the PPA uh, website quite a lot. I feel there is a high level of political interference in our procurement processes. What I do also think um, has not helped us or doesn't seem to be working well for our procurement is that most of our procurement, now, you, we must understand that the procurement in the public sector is huge. Um, whether it's goods and services that are run or that are used on a daily basis or that are used on a, on a, on a very regular basis within the public sector, it's huge. Um, I feel there needs to be some level of coordination in our procurement processes. Coordination in the sense that, look, Across board, across every government department, for example, we know that certain items are going to be procured on a yearly basis, on a monthly basis, on a, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. I do not see the reason why this cannot be coordinated to make or take advantage of economies of scale. I can't see that. So this whole idea of every department has its own procurement process, it goes through... Um, meanwhile, the basis for the procurement are literally similar across board. That has got to change. I, in my view, that has got to change. The, the other side of procurement that I feel, and I've mentioned this earlier, of procurement that I think needs to be looked at very critically is, see, it almost seems as though the, the whole political interference in the in the procurement process is is largely institutionalized. The, the only reason why I can say that factually is because you, there's no proof for this sort of things. You can't prove that this procurement was influenced by a political interference by this person. Okay, but we hear that every day. We we have colleagues who are in the public sector. We have friends who are family who work in this kind of environments who tell you every day that look, this procurement shouldn't have gone to that, or this procurement has been inflated. Um, and it, it's it's these processes that we need to disentangle. Um, and for me, the large element of disentangling, disentangling all of this is the fact that we begin to remove the political element of it, which is basically what this whole agenda of uh, uh, somebody being an executive that is not tied to uh, uh, overly excessive political links that are making demands on, on, our, on our public uh, procurement processes. It's 29 minutes to the top of the hour here on the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. I'm taking my final break. When I come back... We'll talk about winning an election. <laughs> um, there are two pseudo-independent candidates. I'll add Donald Trump. Um, there are three pseudo-independent candidates who have come out in the world, you know, in the past 25 or so years that I've really followed. One of them is Ross Perot of America. One of them is Donald, Donald Trump, also of America. And our very own Emmanuel Macron of America. Of France. Of France. Hey, forgive me. <laughs> we'll see. When we come back, we'll ask if we can add my Kofi Ghani to that list. <laughs> because all of them are presidents now. Uh, apart from Ross, of course. We'll be back. Stay with us. It's your day off and you end up looking after the baby while your wife goes off to work. You realize you have no idea how to change a diaper. So, you when you call your wife. Hello, darling. Yeah, hello. Hello. Ojo, is everything all right? Everything is all right. I'm not seeing Toku. How do I change a baby's diaper, please? Ojo. Ojo. Okay, first, put the diaper... The video call freezes. <laughs> While you wait for the internet to catch up, the baby sprouts a fountain and wets the diaper. As you are getting a new one, your wife comes back online. Kojo, no! Why did you leave a baby alone on the bed? But I had to go and get a new diaper. What must I do next? I beg, quick, 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 quick. Open quick. the front of the diaper. It's the side that has. Wow, look, eh? the video freezes again. Abba. By now, you know where the conversation is going. There's no buffering in real life. So why accept it from your internet connection? Get connected and experience ultra-fast internet to your home, powered by MTN Fiber Broadband. We day for you, everywhere you go. I am Dr. Keisha. Acacia gives your workers the best customer service and treatment options when the need arises, keeping them healthier and more productive for your business. Acacia Health Insurance. We place value on those you value. Wow, yeah. Shandonia Garden is massive. <laughs> hey, what's that over there? It's a plant in its court, swimming pool, and a gym coming soon. And the houses, unique in their own way. Okay, darling, wait till you see ours. What? Why? Wait? Now tell me, what do you think? 
Oh, just so serene. Thank you. I love you. Visit our luxurious gated community at Shandonia Garden of the Tema Highway. Our lands are fully titled and litigation free with flexible payment plans you can afford. So let us bring you to Shandonia Gardens where your dream lands. Contact us today on 0302-732529 and 0302-765436 or visit us at shandoniaproperties.com. Oh my god, today police will use me for light suit. Driver, why? My car insurance has expired, and the police are up ahead. That is why I'm behaving this way. This driver, pa. So, haven't you heard of Sunu Assurances Easy Buy? You just have to dial star 711 star 733 hash to purchase or renew your motor insurance on all mobile money platforms. Ah, so you mean I just dial star 711 star 733 hash and I'll be sorted? Oh my goodness, this is so easy and convenient. Yes, dial star 711 star 733 hash to pay or renew your your moto insurance on all the mobile money platforms. You can locate our offices nationwide at Airport Accra, Spentex, Temba, Kumase, Koforidia, Tamale, Sunyane, Winneba, Cape Coast, Takrade, and Obwasi. You can contact us on 0302-770-548. Sunu Assurances. You pick your way, we take the risk. Welcome to South Africa, your own personal playground. Welcome to the Cape Wine. Welcome to Johannesburg. Welcome to Shaka Marine World. Welcome to Canal World. Welcome, Welcome to the Nelson to Mandela Cap Welcome to, Welcome to, Welcome to the Cape Town Jazz Welcome Festival. To Welcome, Welcome to the Midlands. To the Welcome, to Welcome, Welcome, Welcome to Mabuli. Welcome to East London. Welcome to, Welcome to, to, Welcome to God's Window. With 54 million welcoming South Africans, Welcome all to eager to make your holiday that much more inviting, allow us to indulge you with all our favorite sights and sounds. Visit South Africa. Africa.net to discover more. South Africa, inspiring new ways. This is the 12th edition of the Water Africa and West African Building and Construction Exhibition and Seminar Program in Accra. And it's brought to you by Ace Event Management Limited. This program will be held at the Kempiski Gold Coast City Hotel from the 26th to 28th of June, 2019. Limited exhibition space is still available and I know you don't want to miss this. For more information, call 024-851-8390 or visit www.ace-events.com. Africa presents the fourth annual Ghana Women of the Year Honors, a three-day event to celebrate the superwomen, the women driving the agenda. On Thursday, the 11th of April, we'll have the first ever female CEO's breakfast meeting at the Movenpick Ambassador Hotel. Special guest of honor, Mrs. Freema Osei, the Chief of Staff of the Republic of Ghana. On Friday, the 12th of April, the She Summit, under the theme Beyond Gender, at the Echo Bank Head Office, Ridge, Accra. And finally, on Saturday, the 13th of April, the Ghana Women of the Year Honors at the Labadi Beach Hotel, 7 p.m. sharp. Sponsors, Fidelity Bank, Believe With Us, Verve Clico, Savani Motors, Labadi Beach Hotel, The Bank of Africa, Goyle and Multimedia Group Limited, Media Partners, DSTV and BNFT, with support from UNFPA Ghana and Innovate Advertising. For inquiries, call 050-158-1266. Ghana Women of the Year Honors, Women Inspiring Women. Coffee in your cup and joy on the set. The Super Morning Show is always, always the best, best bet on Joy 99.7 FM. Fellow youth of Ghana, I am happy to address you in what will go down in history as the greatest youth revolution in our dear country. My brothers and sisters, the time has come for the youth to aspire for the highest office of the land, the presidency. Huh? If I was the president or a member of the parliament, huh? Send me a one man penny and I'll send me your mothership big penny. Send me a one man penny and I'll send me your mothership big penny. If I was the president or a member of the parliament, huh? If I was the president or a member of the parliament, huh? Send me a one man penny and I'll send me your mothership big penny. Send me a one man penny and I'll send me your mothership big penny. Anka wo ina buru buru tuwe betra. Boya makai mini muse wu betra. <laughs> 23 minutes to the top of the hour here on the Super Morning Show. The song in the background is by Obwa. If I was a president, and the man in front of me is telling me what he would do if he was president. Mary Kofi Gan has declared that he'll be running as an independent candidate in the year 2020. We began by talking about the power situation, and then we talked about the economy, and then we talked about health, and then we talked about corruption. <laughs> 
<laughs> now comes to actually my favorite part of the interview because now I want to get to know what informed this whole drive. Why does this man want to be president? He's making a lot of... He looks very comfortable living his life as a private individual. Um, the vice president said... The former vice president, late former vice president, um, Parko Sibekui, Mr. Arthur, he said that it's often said, if you want to know where your grandfather is buried, enter politics. Is it I don't know where your grandfather is buried? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, if you can we'll answer our, our questions before we go. But you can visit our private gated community at Sandonia Garden off the Accra Tema Motorway, where we have up to 100 acres of serviced plot, solar street lights, tarred roads, sidewalks, and many more great features where you will be happy to call home with peace of mind, which is fully titled and litigation free. Contact us today on 0302. 732-529 and 020-522-8053. Now, if you are a tested and well-resourced sales personnel, a reputable insurance company needs experienced salespersons at tactical and operational levels. Interested and qualified persons should send their CVs to prosper at cimghana.org to be engaged. CVs should reach us on or before Friday, April 5, 2019. Call 244 40 50 10. ICGC Holy Ghost Temple invites the general public to its Easter edition spiritual emphasis program beginning Tuesday, April 16th to Friday, April 19th. That's next week. Speakers are Reverend Dr. Robert Ampia Kofi, General Overseer at the Global Revival Ministries and President of Ampia Kofi World Outreach. Host pastor is Prophet Christopher Yao Anno, ICGZ Holy Ghost Temple. The date is Tuesday, 16th April to Friday, 19th April, like I said earlier, and 6.30 p.m. each night. On Good Friday, which is next week Friday, there will be a morning service at 9 a.m. and evening service at 6.30 p.m. Venue is Holy Ghost Temple, located at South Fafraha on the Dodowa Road. Come and experience the resurrection power. So, Marek, yes, uh, what's your vision, really, um, if I'm going to speak on a broad sense that has pushed you into this? My vision is quite simple. To have a democracy, which we already have, but to have that democracy begin to deliver value to the Ghanaian people. A democracy that delivers value to the Ghanaian people. What does that mean? It, it means it means a lot of things in a lot of sectors. It means, you know, when it comes to education, I want education to deliver value by helping people who get out of the educational system to be able to create their own opportunities. I want the quality of education uh, that gets delivered to them to get them out in a level that uh, attracts business investments. I, I want the people who get out of education to be able to position themselves uh, in the future uh, or even globally. Uh, when it comes to health, I want value to be delivered from uh, the perspectives of, say, uh, health system being uh, sorry information driven, being lifestyle driven, being efficiency and technology driven, and being uh, balanced in sense of you know uh, the the split between primary and, and secondary healthcare. Um, and, you know, when it comes to infrastructure, I want infrastructure to be able to deliver value um, by looking at the project selection processes on a long-term basis, uh, by coordinating uh, those infrastructures so that, as a whole, uh, they give more to the Ghanaian people than, than uh, looked at individually. And I want some of those uh, infrastructures to have some level of political commitment. So its value, it depends on whichever, you know, sector you're looking at. Um, I've just mentioned three. So all the way through, I want each sector to be able to deliver value to the people. And that means that uh, putting together a team that ensures that, you know, the running of these institutions are focused on only one and only one thing, which is that the Ghanaian people. Now, Kofi Opari Hagen asked the question when we put this out on Facebook. He says he wants to know why you are going back on your own stated position, which is that you don't need to be in power to share your ideas if you have them with the government of the day. Why haven't you shared your ideas? I've always shared my ideas. How? I write. I talk about it. In fact, um, in 2015, I believe, 
uh, I think it's 2015, yes. In 2015, I published a book called, uh, I did it in the form of a magazine, so it's easily carryable around. Uh, that is titled The Marigan Chronicles. Um, and I took about six or so months of work to just research and figure out what the key issues are in different sectors mm. um, and what, by my um, estimates and research at the time, were the solutions that could be considered. That mm. book still exists. I have colleagues on both sides who have access to those books. I have made that book uh, publicly available, even quite recently, put it out there for free downloads. So, and I have written articles. Um, you know, I speak about these things in, in, in the social space. Uh, so, nobody can say now that I have never put my ideas out there. I have been putting my ideas out there since God knows when. Mm. Do you think the media in Ghana is discerning? I believe the media in Ghana is in this discerning. Um, I don't see why not. Um, I've listened to several of the radio stations, uh, watched several of the TV stations. Um, I do feel um, on the side of television, for example, we could do a lot more in focusing uh, our programming uh, to sort of either highlight uh, Ghanaian agendas or, or promote Ghana and, and get us more immersed um, as a country. Um, but in terms of radio, yes, there are, there are uneven uh, troughs and peaks in, mm. you know, in, in Ghanaian radio. There are times that people will lash out and say, We're not getting, you're not getting something right, you as the radio people. Um, but generally, I, I think you know, the media is quite discerning. Because mm. the second question Chris Kofi raised was this one. He, he puts the screenshot of your post. He says, it begins by saying, I think the media in Ghana is not discerning at all. Yes, but the, he's taking that out of context. When I posted that, there must have been a reason why I posted that. There must have been some issue that has come up in the public debate space. And for which, yes, if media needs to be told that on this particular issue you're not being discerning, then yes, it has to be said. So I, it's not a general comment that said mm -hmm. all the time in the year, all the time in the past 10 years, media has not been discerning. I think we need to stop putting things out like that, out of context. Okay. Uh, maybe what he should have done is to go back to the couple of posts before that to figure out what was the issue happening at the time okay. for which reason I said the media is not discerning mm. on that matter, not generally. I mean, if, if I don't find the media discerning, I wouldn't be here. I've been on several other stations. I, I, I don't think the media is generally not mm. discerning. But yes, like I said before, even you read that. Um, there are occasions that the media will get it right, uh, okay. or mostly will get it right, but there are occasions that they will get it wrong. Uh, and if they do, yeah, in a very friendly, fire way, we have to say it because, you know, this is a cooperative agenda, not, of course. not, a, not a dictatorial agenda. Of course, mm. of course. So um, I, I named um, the three people I named earlier for a reason. So Ross Perot ran as an independent candidate. He did not win. Yes. Emmanuel Macron created a political party at the 11th hour he won yes. the election donald trump came from outside the political establishment and joined an established political party right but that is because of the way the american political system is structured it, it's possible that way exactly right. and then and then he won the election as well mm. out of these three the most successful is forming a political machine under you why did you not use that route uh, whose 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 position is out that? of that out of that that's why i limited myself to on, that right i mean it'll be interesting to know on what basis that is the most successful because if you oh, ask like me, i said on the basis of those three rospero has won right uh, rospero did not win right donald trump won right um um right. manuel macron won okay before i answer the question i must say i'm disappointed that you didn't mention uh, uh president uh, patrice uh, talon of benin Mm, mm. Because, oh, yeah, yeah. Good, good idea. <laughs> because he ran as an independent, lost mm. in the first round, won the second round by I think 65 percent or so. So, I would have thought that is closest to home. Mm. Um, but that said, if you ask me what my chances are and why I'm not using a political machinery, mm -hmm. um, I agree that is how we've done politics for so long. But what we also need to agree on is that. Doing politics that way all this while has not largely um, delivered the effects we wanted to deliver. It is rather 
you know, it's not the way it was intended, but it's turned out not to work the way we intended it to. The idea of forming political parties when, uh, you know, the multi-party uh, 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 jurisdiction started um, was that by the time you get to election, you would have garnered a viewpoint of what the people need and be able to deliver that because, you know, they are your party members, you would be very close to them. And therefore, you can, you know, sort of get a sense of what the people need and be able to deal with that. Mm -hmm. What it's turned out to be, it's it's not what it was originally intended for. And I so I don't feel that because it's always been the case, something different cannot happen. And okay. this is what I say to people. The fact that the crafters of our constitution, and we cannot sideline them because it did a, a, a massively uh, Hitchcockian tax at the time, mm -hmm. is that the fact that they have given essence to uh, an independent presidential candidate in the constitution should tell us that at some point, whether back then or in the future when they were drafting it, they did genuinely believe that um, a time will come, or had come at a time, nobody knows, that they felt that this would be a viable option. And we can we can walk away from that. Okay. Uh, so that option is available, and you feel that we must step away from the norm? I feel that we have not explored this option so far. Look, for several years, uh, independent candidacy has been ridiculed. It's mm. been seen as uh, a non-starter, almost. I think it's about time we re-have that conversation and make it onerous on the people themselves to decide for okay. themselves that, look, um, it's not about the machinery. It's about the quality of the uh, of, of the process. And I think that's what I bring to the table, is to make people take a second look at this whole concept of independent candidacy. It's not a fluke. Hmm. Final question, and I've already seen the explanation put out on your Facebook wall, but um, from a listener here, uh, he wants to know what your original name is and why you changed it. <laughs> that question has come up several times, and I've responded to it several times. My mm. name was Charles Kofi Fakbe. I've maintained the Kofi. It's the most dear part of my whole name to me. I'm Kofi as well. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> well, I won't say anything more before I cross a <laughs> Um So, I, I'm still named Kofi. I still call myself Kofi. In fact, I rather prefer to be called Kofi most of the times than Marek, because I'm I'm dear to that name. The reason why I changed Charles, um, gosh, my so my father named me Charles. I've always thought that my uh, I was named after uh, Prince Charles of, of England. Uh, uh, it turned out not to be so. Um, so I engaged my dad later on in life. I was quite older then. I was past 40 when I changed my name. Um, or I just got into 40 when I changed my name. Okay. Um, and I talked to my father, and he mentioned that, oh, actually, he wasn't naming, or he did not name me after uh, the Prince Charles, uh, which is a bit of a disappointment. But um, he named me after President Charles de Gaulle, uh, the French president. Mm -hmm. And his fascination at the time, I mean, he was a young man. Uh, his fascination at the time was he, was he was a tough guy. Tough in the sense that at the time, he was the only president who was, uh, you know, who had... Um, uh, successfully gone past the most number of assassination attempts. Now, up to that time, I did not believe in the power of names. What did strike me was that at the point where I was doing this personal sort of historical investigation into my name, I had already gone past 11 accidents. And they were all near-death experiences. Um, and so I had to come to the conclusion, I'm, I'm also a spiritual man as well, I had to come to the conclusion that, you know what, the essence of the name was being derived from the, you know, the giver of the name and the basis upon which he felt it was a cool name to give at the time. I am an adult now. I did not know how many more assassination attempts I was going to survive. So, you know, very politely, I, you know, had... To engage him and my uh, mother, who are they are both quite old now, um, and say, you know what? I know you're still alive, and this is um, something heavy for you to deal with. But this is what it is, and I do need to change my name. And I had your blessing, and my name has been changed. All right. Um. So that was for. How about Fekpe to Gan? Um, Fekpe to Gan was um. That is more of a. a a personal agenda. I um, um, 
I wanted, so that followed on right after my first discovery around the name Charles. Um, I won't go into the detail of what, you know, Fekpe means because, you know, there's still people who are called Fekpe. I want to give them that respect. I felt at that time that, you know, I needed, my name, Gan literally just means a, a garden of wisdom. That's all it means. Uh, it's nothing uh, way more than that. Fekpe, I felt I needed to change at a time. I, I mean, it was an opportunity for me. If I'm changing Charles, it's a brilliant opportunity if I didn't want to go with Fekpe to do to all at again. once. And mm -hmm. so I decided to go all at once. And, and people keep saying uh, Gan is not a Ghanaian name. I, and I beg to differ. There are Gans in the in the upper Volta. Well, it's now upper Volta because the top has been cut off. So it's so become OT upper region. Volta. Um, no. The it's not OT now stands, but the Volta itself now, which used to be the oh, middle okay. so Volta, is the upper it's part of the Volta, Volta region. now currently. Oh, okay. the current Volta been, right, oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, have names as Gan it's okay. spelled the same way, you know. So <laughs> it's not it's not something you know that is non Ghanaian. Okay. Or I'm not brothelizing mm. anything. So I mean, people. Um, have, so, you know, so the explanation is, is yeah. I mean, uh, but I've put you. it down several times. So. No, no, no. Uh, because the text <laughs> came in, up. I felt that. In fact, <laughs> so, I'll make a confession. This is the question we we agreed as a team not to ask because we had heard. But the question came in from the listeners. That's so fine. That I'm happy we to must answer. Serve, it. We must serve the public. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary Kofi Gan, for joining us. Thank you. All right. This has been the Super Morning Show with me, Daniel Daze. This is Joe 99.7 FM. In a few minutes, we take the news on top of the R and then Sammy Forsen will come and bring us the Cosmopolitan Mix. But it's been a super day. We apologize for not being able to bring you that interview with uh, the Energy Ministry and the Ghana Water Company Limited. We worked the phone lines as much as we could. We were unable to. We will be getting those responses during the day. Stay tuned to your Superstation. So have yourselves a super day. <clears throat> Just remember, God loves you. Love him too. I'm out. Tomorrow we're back. 10 minutes to 6 a.m. Goodbye.